All right, so now we get to the whole reason for really dealing with linear momentum, and that is there are some systems in which linear momentum is conserved, i.e. it's a constant. Physicists search for things that are constant because this enables them to use that with algebraic equations to solve hard problems without using this advanced math. So if something is conserved, if it's constant, that's a fundamental rule and an ability to compute things easier than if you have to use something that's changing. Conservation of energy is one thing that some systems conserve, mechanical energy. Some things conserve linear momentum. Some systems conserve angular momentum. So we're always on the lookout for something that conserves a particular quantity. Now, back in the times of the 1500s, Rene Descartes, like many others, was looking for an explanation of the universe itself. And to him, the universe, if you was, was a giant clock. It was mechanical, and it followed laws that were predictable. And this view was spread out to other people, including Isaac Newton. Now, in this great clock of the planets moving through the heavens, it was important that there be some principle by which the heavens continued to work forever. They were given a start by, in his case, his thought of God, and then the these planets should continue to move forever. If they didn't, if they were to stop, then that would imply that it was imperfect. It was imperfect. It would imply the Creator was imperfect. So Descartes came upon a principle which we believe in today, and the idea of conservation of linear momentum. And it kind of goes something like this. If you have a ball, say, over a table, and there's a bunch of other, turns out, balls inside, and if you let that ball go, the ball has some motion, and it hits the table, and it stops. Descartes said that whatever motion the ball had, had to be passed on to other things. Well, we believe that today. It passed on by the vibration and the motion of the atoms inside the table, by the motion of air molecules going out, but the net overall motion of the universe, its linear momentum, is conserved. Such a system of the universe is what's called an isolated system. Now, usually we don't count up the universe because that's too difficult, so we take something a little simpler, something like, for instance, in outer space, maybe we're talking about a rocket. And if you're in outer space, there really is gravity on you, the various planets, but the force is very small because you're far removed from them compared to the Earth. So we could think of the rocket as being largely with no forces upon it. If there are no forces upon it, it has no net external force, then Newton's second law says that if the external force is equal to zero, delta P over delta T is zero. But if delta P over delta T is zero, then that means that delta P is zero. There's no change in linear momentum, or P is a constant. If you reverse this, you get really what's called the force law. A body will continue with constant linear momentum. constant P, unless acted upon by a net external force. So that's the nature of everything. It wants to go at a constant P, provided there's no net external force. Now, there could be forces acting, but if they cancel, or if there are none on it, as there is almost none on it on a rocket, then the rocket will continue with a constant velocity, because it has a constant mass, if it's not shooting anything out, forever. Now, even in outer space, if it throws stuff out one way, it recoils in the other to conserve P, because there's no net external force outside. So this is one way in which P can be conserved, and you can solve problems where you know, for instance, if it does throw something out, P initially has to equal P final. And you can match those two things up. You can draw before and after pictures, just like we did with the energy stuff. More common problem to apply conservation of energy are what are known as collisions and explosions. So you have something like 
a ball or something like that and it explodes and initially let's say the ball is just the bomb is set in here and it explodes and it breaks into maybe four parts this part this part this part and this part each one of those can have some P what it says is that if you sum up the arrows of all of those parts because this occurs in almost no time delta P equal to the force the external force times delta T but if delta T of the explosion or collision is approximately zero then there can be no change in the linear momentum of the system so if you add these arrows up P1 P2 P3 P4 the arrows have to add up to zero so if I know three of the parts I could find the fourth as I know it has to add up to zero this is very common a difficult problem but not if we use P and why do I say it would be a difficult problem because I don't know what the individual forces between these pieces are linear momentum enables me to simply skip over that problem I like to joke there used to be a, a cartoon that had a, a set of, of uh, various steps like e equals MC squared and and then he gets down to step 3 and the guy writes something like and then a miracle occurs and he writes the answer to the proof and his teacher says could you be a little more explicit about what step three is well it's almost that away miraculously whatever happens in the collision of two things smashing each other or blowing up we can just use delta P and we don't have to understand the fine points of what's going on on the inside. It is close to then a miracle occurs. Now collisions are things that we see a lot of times. Car crashes. Physicists like to throw things at high speeds because we get the most incredible forces that ever exist in the world if we make delta T go small. We can have forces that have existed only at the beginning of the Big Bang forces that are greater than occurring nuclear explosions this is why we like these large hadron colliders so we throw things at but you can have less violent collisions for instance pool balls can hit so you can take one pool ball here going like this with some speed call it v1 and m1 and you can bang into another pool ball over here m2 maybe it's going at some speed v2 let's look at what happens when they collide so when they collide there's one pool ball here's the other pool ball this pool ball will apply a force in this direction call it a normal force and in this case based on the direction I drew it if this is X and Y that force is in the negative X direction and it will interact for some time and it will create some area and that area will be negative area and it will change the momentum in the negative direction changing this velocity now it's possible that this will be so much momentum that it'll continue this way or it might turn this ball around and make it go the other way but the area under here will be negative if you take a look at the other perspective though this pool ball will apply a force on the green pool ball that will be of the same magnitude in the opposite direction the third law so its force will look like this same shape and everything and if I've done it correctly it will be over the same time so we will have exactly the same area so the green pool balls momentum will be changed 
by this force. If we consider the pink pool ball and the green together though, the sum of the interaction here and the sum of the interaction there add up to nothing, in which case the total momentum m1 v1 plus m2 v2 is conserved. Another way of looking at that is this force plus this force is no force and no forces leads to an isolated system and you do not change P. So P is conserved in a collision. Now you may object to this by saying, but what about friction? What about gravity? What about these sort of things? Here's the thing. If you had a pool ball, maybe it has a weight of one Newton. This interaction is going to occur maybe at a time frame of 1 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So is there some area under there? Yeah, about 1 times 10 to the minus 6 Newton seconds. This collision force, this normal force, if I drew it, it's going to be more like this. It'll be very short time. 1 by 10 to the minus 6 seconds. But the force may be so large that delta P happens to be about 25 Newton seconds. To do that, this will have to be 2.5 times 10 to the 7 Newtons incredibly large force. So when these things collide, they occur for such a short time that small forces like weight, friction, things like that can just be ignored. We just don't even consider them because yes there's some area but there's so little area here compared to the area that we're talking about you just don't have to care about it. Now in the next video we'll talk about the two types of collisions you can get and we'll work a problem.